The Indian seer, Sri Aurobindo, wrote in 1914. At present, mankind is undergoing an evolutionary crisis in which is concealed a choice of its destiny. A stage has been reached in which the human mind has achieved in certain directions an enormous development, while in others it stands arrested and bewildered and can no longer find its way. Look at man, the thinker, lost in his thoughts. This is humanity today facing a tremendous crisis. Reason and science can only help by standardizing, by fixing everything into an artificially arranged, mechanized unity of material life. The problems created by the power of thought cannot be resolved by more thinking. It is in inner silence that a greater consciousness dawns. Our human knowledge is a candle burnt on a dim altar to a sun-vast truth. This sun-vast truth is dawning upon Earth as the next step in Earth's evolution, and the human crisis is a veiled drama of its manifestation. Sri Aurobindo calls this greater consciousness the supermind. The central fact, the essential and cardinal significance of the evolution is not development and perfection of the outer and instrumental form, but the development and increasing perfection of consciousness. Reason is not the last word, nor the reasoning animal, the supreme figure of nature. As man emerged out of the animal, so out of man the superman emerges. The step from man to superman is the next approaching achievement in the Earth's evolution. It is inevitable because it is at once the intention of the inner spirit and the logic of nature's process. It is only the full emergence of the soul, the full descent of the native light and power of the spirit, and the consequent replacement or transformation and uplifting of our insufficient mental and vital nature by a spiritual and supramental supernature that can effect this evolutionary miracle. Sri Aurobindo and the mother called this process of transformation integral yoga.
The ancient Vedic rishis of India have known the reality of the evolution of consciousness. The evolutionary journey of the soul through many births, through different life forms, till it reaches human form capable of ascending into a greater consciousness, was well known. They have explored the cosmic consciousness and the sun-vast truth of the supermind. However, the knowledge was lost over millennia. After the advent of Buddhism, life on earth was increasingly seen as misery and later even as illusion, maya. The purpose of life was reduced into getting out of the wheel of karma and the cycle of rebirth. spiritual life turned otherworldly and rejected the world of forms and missed the evolutionary purpose and the possibility of divine life upon earth. Spiritual quest became a withdrawal from the world and the field of action. Seekers of truth turned away from the material reality. As a nation, India lost vitality, which led to foreign invasions and the decline of India. While India was falling asleep, science and materialism was rising in the West. Harnessing the power of reason, mathematics and objective experimental validation, science successfully overthrew the medieval Christian religious superstitions and suppressions in Europe and opened the doorways of a new truth that anchored itself on verifiable sensory data. Sri Aurobindo wrote about science in his epic poem, Savitri. I have mapped the heavens and analyzed the stars, described their orbits through the grooves of space measured the miles that separate the suns, computed their longevity in time. I have delved into Earth's bowels and torn out the riches guarded by her dull brown soil. The tree of evolution I have sketched, each branch and twig and leaf in its own place. In the embryo tracked the history of forms and the genealogy framed of all that lives. I have detected plasm and cell and gene, the protozoa traced 
man's ancestors, the humble originals from whom he rose. I know how he was born and how he dies. Only what end he serves, I know not yet, or if there is aim at all or any end or push of rich, creative, purposeful joy in the wide works of the terrestrial power. I have caught her intricate processes, none is left. Her huge machinery is in my hands. I have seized the cosmic energies for my use. I have bored on her infinitesimal elements and her invisible atoms have unmasked. All matter is a book I have perused. Only some pages now are left to read. If God is at work, his secrets I have found. But still the cause of things is left in doubt. Their truth flees from pursuit into a void. When all has been explained, nothing is known. What I have learned, chance leaps to contradict. What I have built is seized and torn by fate. I can foresee the acts of matter's force, but not the march of the destiny of man. He is driven upon paths he did not choose. He falls trampled underneath the rolling wheels. Perhaps the world is an error of our sight, a trick repeated in each flash of sense. An unreal mind hallucinates the soul with a stressed vision of false reality or a dance of Maya veils the void unborn. He too is a machine amid machines. A piston brain pumps out the shapes of thought. A beating heart cuts out emotions modes. An insentient energy fabricates a soul. The word soul or spirit is practically meaningless from the point of view of science, a concept that is not required to explain the birth and death of the universe. On one side, we have science rejecting the reality of the spirit. And on the other side, we have the ascetics rejecting the reality of the material world. In India, if the result has been a great heaping up of the treasures of the spirit, or of some of them, it has also been a great bankruptcy of life. In the West, the fullness of riches and the triumphant mastery of this world's power and possessions have progressed towards an equal bankruptcy in the things of the spirit. If science has reduced everything into mechanical forces, Ascetics 
have reduced everything into pure consciousness. To arrive at a greater synthesis, we must know the relationship between consciousness and force. The wall between consciousness and force, impersonality and personality, becomes much thinner when one goes behind the veil of matter. If one looks at a working from the side of impersonal force, it appears to be impersonal and mechanical. If one looks from the side of personality, of being, one sees a being possessing, guiding and using a conscious force as its instrument of action and expression. In modern science, it has been found that if you look at the movement of energy, it appears on one side to be a wave and act as a wave, on the other side as a mass of particles and to act as a mass of particles, each in its own way. It is somewhat the same principle here. The force that builds the worlds is a conscious force. Sri Aurobindo speaks of consciousness and force as inseparable, two sides of the same thing. He puts them together as one word, conscious force, or consciousness force, or chit shakti in Sanskrit. The teaching of Sri Aurobindo starts from that of the ancient sages of India, that behind the appearances of the universe, there is the reality of a being and consciousness, a self of all things, one and eternal. This one being and consciousness is involved here in matter. Evolution is the method by which it liberates itself. Consciousness appears in what seems to be inconscient, and once having appeared, is self-impelled to grow higher and higher, and at the same time to enlarge and develop towards a greater and greater perfection. Life is the first step of this release of consciousness. Mind is the second. But evolution does not cease with the mind, for man is a transitional being. He is not final. The step from man to superman is the next approaching achievement in the Earth's evolution. This awaits a release, a consciousness, which is spiritual and supramental. For only then will the involved divinity in things release itself entirely and it become possible for life to manifest perfection. Evolution continues. Where the higher ranges of mind ends, a greater splendor begins.